until 12. Um, we, over the years, we were talking about this morning about how we get sort of this creep of, um, of how time goes forth. It's, uh, you know, when we first started out, I think we started at having services starting at 10, and we continue to move, move up a little further. But then a revelation came to me, which I shared with, the, with a couple of the guys, and that is, you know, some 2,000 years ago, um, we started worshiping on the Shabbat, but as time passed and time went along and there was sort of Shabbat creep, we are now observing Shabbat on Sunday. That was a joke. Is everyone awake this morning? All right. The message this morning, and it's a, it's a, it's a message from continuation of Shavuot, um, is to be or not to be under the law. To be or not to be under the law. This is, this is a whole section that's totally misunderstood, mistaught in, in Christianity, mistaught in, in churches, and, and um, has evolved into a lot of different things. Um, I feel that it's appropriate during Shavuot to talk about it. Um, to give you clarity and give you a better understanding of how the Jewish scriptures and how the Brit Kaddishah, it's in a Jewish context, what really means to be uh, influenced and, and affected by the law. And it all ties into what we talked about on Shavuot, and that was about how um, it was recognized that uh, the Ten Commandments were given um, on, during that, that festival. There was a preparation time before that. Uh, the people, B'nai Israel, were required for three days to prepare for what they were going to receive. Uh, we see where uh, in, on Shavuot in, in, in Day of Pentecost, um, in the Brit Kadashah, the New Covenant, we see how there was a preparation time. And then there was also um, when God showed up and poured out his spirit upon those that were there some 2,000 years ago. So we're going to talk about that, and we're going to compare an analogy between between the cloud and the fire. And, and my hope is, is that you have a better understanding of what this means about the law and instruction and how as it relates to the cloud by day and the fire by night and God's Torah and God's Ruach HaKodesh, God's Holy Spirit um, that comes to guide and instruct and convict and comfort all of us. Now today's parasha, Baha Alotcha, uh, it means when you set up. And we're going to start this by turning to Bami Bar, Numbers, chapter 9, verses 15 through 23, to set the tone for the message this morning. Now, on the day that the tabernacle was raised up, the cloud covered the tabernacle and the tents of the testimony. From evening until morning, it was above the tabernacle like the appearance of fire. So it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, after the children of Israel would journey, and in the place where the clouds settled, there the children of Israel would pitch their tents. At the command of the Lord, the children of Israel would journey. At the command of the Lord, they would camp. As long as the clouds stayed above the tabernacle, they remained encamped. Even when the, the cloud continued long, many days above the tabernacle, the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not journey. So it was when the cloud was above the tabernacle a few days, according to the command of the Lord, they would remain encamped, and according to the command of the Lord, they would journey. So it was when the cloud remained only from evening until morning, when the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they would journey, whether by day or by night. Whenever the cloud was taken up, they would journey. Whether it was two days, a month, or a year that the cloud remained above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would remain encamped and not journey. But when it was taken up, they would journey. And at the command of the Lord, they remained encamped. At the command of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Now let's begin to put this into context how it applies to us today. How many know that we are the temples of the Holy Spirit? And we are the tabernacles of God. But we are flesh, correct? Are we not flesh? Is there anyone here that's not flesh? And we're all spirit, correct? And then we also have God's Holy Spirit, his Ruach HaKodesh. And so as we look at this, I want you to keep this in mind about how over the tabernacle, the cloud covered it by day, and 
the appearance of fire was there by night. So I want you to keep that in the context of the message this morning. You find that in, in Bamibar, uh, Bab, Bamibar uh, 9, uh, verse 16. So it, w all, so it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. Here we see two distinct manifestations. One a cloud, the other fire. Now these two manifestations, we see the presence of God in both of those manifestations. And the children, B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, followed God's cloud by day and God's fire by night. And it was in these two manifestations where the children of Israel, B'nai Israel, found safety against the enemy. We see that in scripture. And we see where they received direction from God on when and where to proceed. It is also where we hear God's voice for the first time on Har Sinai, Mount Sinai, coming out of the cloud when God gave his Ten Commandments at those that were present on that day, the children of Israel and those that had come out of Mitzrayim, Egypt, with them, receiving the word of God, the Ten Commandments, at Har Sinai, Mount Sinai. And we see that even in that presence, we read in Scripture that when on that event, it was not only spoken for those that were present, but God intended it to continue throughout the generations to be given to all those who were willing to hear his instruction, his commandments, all the way up to our generation, the significance of that feast, and for the generations to come if the Lord chooses to tarry. Shemot 19, 9 through 11 says this. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes let, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So God told Moshe to consecrate the people to hear what God had to say for them. And this has been designated on Shavuot. Shavuot is a time in which you need to attune your ears to hear, to be prepared to hear what God has to say for us. And it is this time in which God speaks, speaks in important, um, uh, speaks in a, in a different way because he shows up at different festivals for different purposes. And on Shavuot, the focus is on his instruction, his commandments, and how he guides his people. Davarim, Deuteronomy 5, 22 through 24 says this. These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly. In the mountain from the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness with a loud voice. And he added no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. So it was when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, that you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And you said... Surely the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that, the, that God speaks with man, and yet he still lives. So we see where he spoke out of the cloud and gave the commandments, but we also see where he spoke out of the fire. And it was through that fire and rumbling, rumbling and, the, and the lightnings and thundering that really put the fear, the reverence upon the people about how they wanted to distance themselves, themselves from God and be able to be able to talk to God through a mediator, and in this case it was Moshe. So we see here where the significance of the cloud and fire about how God speaks has different impact upon the people. One was a physical impact, the other one was a spiritual impact upon how they received the words that came forth from God. In the Brit Kadashah, we also read about how God speaks out of a cloud and also out of fire. Matthew 17, 1 through 6 says this about the cloud. Now after six days, Yeshua took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to him, to them, 
talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Yeshua, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. Now, so we see that, that God's command, instruction, and, and interaction with the men that were on the mount on that day uh, came out of the cloud. We also see the event coming out of fire. Turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, which says this. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So to, to contrast here, you can, you can see where God has his words for those that belong to him, and that his words will come through the form of a cloud, which in essence we can equate or relate to the Torah, because that's in which it came forth. And we also can see where he speaks through the ha'esh, the fire of his ruach hakodesh, and it is through that experience that we saw on Shavuot, Pentecost, and when all uh, his spirit was poured out upon all flesh. So we can also relate it, besides the Torah with the cloud and the Holy Spirit with his fire, we can also relate it to us. And that is, is that the cloud addresses our flesh. The cloud addresses our flesh, and the fire addresses our spirit that dwells in us, both man and woman. So we see these two contrasts of how God speaks and how God interacts with us as flesh and as spirit. So the cloud, I want you to take a parallel between the cloud and our flesh and the spirit and um, our spirits as we progress with the rest of the message. Turn with me, which I brought up on, on Shavuot in the message uh, that evening. Turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, which is the verse that we are now, we preface this verse by what we just talked about. Now let's talk about it in more detail as we continue on with the message this morning. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So how do we cleanse the flesh and the spirit? How do we cleanse our flesh and our spirit? Well, first of all, we ask for forgiveness of sins. Scripture instructs us to do this. After, however, you know what makes you filthy. What makes you filthy in the spirit and what makes you filthy in the flesh? The flesh by the cloud, his Torah gives you that guidance. And the fire of his spirit gives you that instruction or that guidance also on what types of things are filthy as it relates to God and as it relates to us in which we are to ask for forgiveness of. Now remember, the cloud was by what? Day, over the tabernacle. As the Torah is for the flesh, it can be seen. You following that? The Torah which relates to the flesh, can be seen just like the cloud that was over the tabernacle can be seen. Whereas the fire, which was by night, is just like God's spirit and the spirit that dwells within man and woman because the spirit is on the inside of us and it is concealed. Much like in the darkness, the fire was needed in order to give guidance. So knowing what makes you filthy relates to matters of the flesh and that God has given us instruction to correct the fleshly matters through the cloud and through his Torah. Matthew 7 verse 6 says this. 
Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn and tear you in pieces. Now let me give you an example of this, don't throw your pearls before swine, and I'm going to have you look at this in a different context that you may have looked at it before. You can read it in more of an arrogant way, that for those of you that know the scripture and that, and somebody rejects you from sharing scripture or, or God's word, um, you you. Many of us, I know you've all heard, where they'll say, do not, the response is, well, we're not going to cast our pearls before swine. How many have heard that? Right? Okay. You need to look at it in a different context. And let me give you this context to put into your, to your mind to contemplate. Pigs, swine, don't know what is dirty and they don't know what is bad do they pigs don't know what's dirty and they don't know what is bad and the reason they don't know what is dirty or what is bad is because to them nothing is dirty nothing is bad so a pig doesn't make a distinction so when you read, do not throw your pearls before swine, you can interpret it to mean you can't take the word of God and throw it into someone that doesn't even know the difference between what is right and what is wrong, what is dirty, what is filthy. They won't get it. They won't get it. Also knowing what makes you filthy related to your spirit. God gave us instruction to know and to correct the spiritual matters. Matthew 5, 17 through 22 says this. And this goes to this fire side. We just talked about the cloud side. We're going to talk about the fire side. What's on the inside? How many know that the Torah was designed to deal with the fleshly matters about sin on the outside? How many know that? Rabbinic Judaism teaches that, how there's different fences to keep you from sinning. All the things are, that are in the physical. But what about the spiritual? What are we supposed to do with this? What are we supposed to do with the, with the matters of the spirit? Yeshua gives us instruction. Matthew 5, 17 through 22 says this. Do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. For assuredly Now I stop. He came to complete. He did not come to destroy, meaning that he's not coming to in, misinterpret the word of God, the Torah, because he spoke the Torah. Yeshua spoke the Torah. So we know that he didn't come to, to destroy or misinterpret, which would cause destruction in the law, but he came to complete it. So God had given us instruction on how to deal with our flesh on the outside. What Yeshua did was he came to fix the sins that occur on the inside before they manifest out on the outside. So manifestation goes to the nature of sin and how it comes out. And Yeshua is coming to give us completeness by now teaching us how to deal with the sin that's inherent on the spiritual side of man and woman on the inside. Now keep that in mind and think about what he's saying when we continue on with these verses. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will, not, will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of these, one of the least of these commandments, and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Stop. That seems to be impossible because they were deemed to be the most righteous, but they were the most righteous on the outside. What Yeshua is talking about is your righteousness has to exceed them in order to enter the kingdom, meaning that in order for us to be complete, we have to receive the instruction from God on how to deal with the spiritual matters that are on the inside, and the only way that can be dealt with is through the interaction of our spirits with the Ruach HaKodesh the Holy Spirit, which comes to convict, which comes to, to guide, it comes to instruct, it comes to comfort, it comes to give us the things that we need in order to correct our insides from the filthiness that's inherent in our physical 
and our spiritual flesh. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So that's why the righteousness has to be exceeded. In that time, the Ruach HaKodesh had not been poured out. They didn't understand what that meant. But after, after Shavuot, it became clearer of the significance of what Yeshua was teaching. And we'll read in a few moments about how Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul, addresses this. Now let's continue on. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Now, you know where that came from, right? Where's it come from? Torah, right? Which deals with the flesh, which was spoken out of the cloud, right? Okay, now, what does he say to you? What does Yeshua say? But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Now he's dealing with the sin on the inside. Those ideas that are contemplated inside of each and every one of us before it comes out. And Yeshua is saying, uh-uh, you don't get forgiven of your sins just because you give the ex external appearance that you are sinless. You have to deal with the sin on the inside in order for you to receive life everlasting. That's why your heart has to be changed on the inside. That's why we have to have hearts of flesh in order to be flexible enough to have the Ruach HaKodesh and God's Word work together in unison in order for us to mature in the faith. And that word maturity in the Hebrew really means perfection. When you read the word perfection, it really means maturing. Is everyone still with me? Well, let's let, get some additional clarity around this by turning to the book of James. The book of James was contemplated not being even incorporated into the Brit Kadashah, the New Covenant, because it sounded too much like Jewish interpretation. It was almost excluded from scriptures because of that. But we can get clarity from what we just read and what we heard from Yeshua by looking at the book of James, by addressing the sin cycle in the book of James chapter 1, and let's look at verses 12 through 15, which says this. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Stop. Where are your own desires and enticement come from? Inside, right? If anyone's looking at you as a person on the outside, look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Can you see what desires or enticements going on in their lives? You can't, can you? Because that's something that's going on on the inside. Well, some of you can say you see it. <laughs> but then you're judging. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away from his or hers own desires and enticed. Then when the desire is conceived, once it's contemplated, it's thought about, it's elevated, it's conceived, it's decided that I'm going to act upon what I think, it gives birth to sin. Why? Because then the next step is, I'm going to do this, and then you step out and you act and do it. And when you do that, then it brings forth death. Because then you're subject to the external commandments of God, which cause you to be subject to judgments. Because the sin that was inside of you, you contemplate it, you decide to do it, you step out and do it, then you're subject to the God's instruction, which could lead to death. You following me? You see this transition from spirit to, to, to physical? Okay. These instructions have been put in place by God as a way to deal with sin associated with the flesh and the spirit. But I will, I will not stand up here today and tell you it's easy. It's not easy to deal with these kind of things. Um, Rob, uh, Rabbi Michael talked about it a few weeks ago, about the differences between, between sinning and, and the things you do in the flesh. And, and it's not easy. 
Look at what Rav Shaul said in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, where he addresses this. Listen to what he says. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now stop. After we just went through the last 20 minutes of what we talked about, do you read this verse differently? I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. If you're walking in the spirit, if you're addressing the issues in ta inside, you're letting the Ruach HaKodesh give you guidance and instruction, if you're allowing the word of God to be quickened in your minds, to come to your attention, before you're addressing these things, that's walking in the spirit. That's contemplating every step you're going to make on the outside of your life, but you're thinking through it before you do it on the inside. That's walking in the spirit and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh, meaning that you are addressing the sin on the inside before you allow those lusts and desires to entice you to act and then, mo and then move on those actions in the physical. Now verse 17 on says this. For the flesh lusts against the spirit. Now, see there's a difference. See, now we're, we're talking about distinctions between flesh and spirit. Our fleshly bodies and the spirits that dwell in us. And the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary to one another. They're constantly warring against each other. There's always this internal fight between the flesh or the spirit. Uh, uh, Rebetzin Michelle prayed this morning that we are, to, to, we are to decrease in the flesh, that the Lord may increase within us. We're supposed to be dealing with these issues that are inside us. And then when God is, is stronger in us, it keeps the flesh in check. When the spirit is weaker in us, the flesh will elevate. It's a balancing uh, exercise that we go through. And they're contrary to one another, so you do not do the things that you wish in the flesh. The spirit is interested in you doing the right thing. The flesh is interested in you doing the wrong thing. That's the yetzer hara, yetzer hato, the evil inclination, the good inclination. But if you are led by the good inclination that's moved and stirred in you by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, you are not under the law. You are not subject to the external laws that God has put in place to deal with the flesh because those things do not manifest in you they never come out. But do you sin? Absolutely. Because we, Yeshua said, if you even think about it, you sin, you have to ask for forgiveness of that. And have to have the faith to believe that you're forgiven for that. He is saying the law of the flesh is not necessary. Rav Shalu is giving instruction that the law of the flesh, the Torah, is not necessary in that the sin should be addressed before it surfaces on the outside of us. Are you getting that? After what we just talked about for the last 25 minutes? You see what, I'm, see what the meaning is here? Thus then, once it does come out, the Torah has to apply. God's instruction to the flesh have to apply. That's the law. Now, for those of you that... Maybe this may be new for you to hear. Let me give you a, an example of how you can apply it and then study the word as it relates to law and relates to instruction and God's instruction. How many know there's all kinds of different laws? All kinds of laws. Different things that we have to follow. Let's look at an example. How many have ever thought about speeding in your car? How many have ever thought about it? There's different reasons on why you speed. Some of it's because you're too early for Shabbat, so you have to slow down. No. Maybe you're missing an appointment. Maybe you're late for work. And so you're, speed, you're contemplating speeding. So you think about it. Well, what's a deterrent from you to... What's, what stops you from speeding? Well, if you see a police officer with a motorcycle on the side of the road, that's going to deter you from speeding, right? 
If you, if you see uh, uh, a police officer uh, sitting out with his, with his gun shooting the cars, trying to get the license plate, and some of you guys get tricky and don't have license plates on the front, thinking that you're not going to get caught. So, so if they're sitting out there, that may deter you from speeding, right? But, but let's, take a, let's take that away for a second. What if you're just thinking about speeding? Are you violating the law because you thought about it and you contemplated it? You are on the inside based upon what Yeshua said because the mere fact you contemplated speeding to get to that place says that you, in essence, were violating the law on the inside. Now, how does that equate to the outside? It equates to the outside that what if you just go by that police officer going 55 miles an hour, a police officer looks at you and says, oh, didn't violate anything, keep going, right? But in your head, on the inside, you planned on speeding had you not seen that police officer. You broke the law. You broke the law on the inside, but it didn't manifest out on the outside. So there's no punishment, there's no financial problem, or there's no jail time for you violating it because you didn't get caught in the physical because you addressed it on the inside. You following that? That's the same way with God's instruction. That's why he sent his Ruach HaKodesh, so that we would have guidance and instruction, something to convict us on the inside, to quicken our minds, to remember God's instruction, to say, we can't do this, because if we do, we'll be sinning. And if we sin, it could result in judgment if we act upon it. Now let's contrast the flesh and the spirit in the, in the minutes that are left here. Contrasting the flesh and the spirit, which we all are. And let's listen to what Rav Shalul has to say about it in the book of Romans, chapter 7, verses 22 through 25, which says this. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God, through Yeshua Messiah our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, if you read this without any Jewish understanding, or, or, or we're maybe sleeping through the last 28 minutes of the sermon that we were just talking about, you're going to think that what he's saying here is I'm not under the law and I'm not subject to this because I believe in Yeshua. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying I'm constantly fighting with my flesh and my spirit, which are two separate manifestations of us as beings. Two different things that are contrary to each other. Two separate inherent natures, the flesh and the spirit, both of which need to be addressed. We need the cloud, which is God's written word, and we need the fire, which is the word from his spirit that convicts. Yeah, but the difference between us in flesh and spirit, we don't have time to get into it because it goes to the whole understanding of the first Adam and the second Adam. The whole difference of why we don't have harmony between our flesh and our spirit is because of that event, which we don't, can't talk about or we don't have time to talk about it this morning. Because I'll be hearing all your stomachs growling too loud and it will sort of cover up the message. But... We are talking about harmony with God. God's word is in harmony with God's spirit, which comes to guide and instruct and give us comfort. John 16, verse 13 says this. How about when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. God's word and his spirit, 
his cloud and his fire are in harmony. They work together. They work in the daytime. They work in the nighttime. They work on the external. They work on the internal. And it was divined by God to deal with man and woman's flesh and spirit that are not in harmony. They are, they are disconnected. Why are they disconnected? Because man and women's flesh are going to perish. These fleshly corrupt bodies are going to go to the grave. And the spirit of man and woman may perish depending upon your choices. Choices of Yetzer Hara, Yetzer Hato, following God's instruction on the inside, following God's instruction on the outside. It depends upon the instruction. And if you follow God's instruction, belong to him, and hold on to the end, and don't let anyone steal your crown, you have a life everlasting, and you will receive an incorruptible body in the end times. Romans 8, 1 through 14 says this. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Mashiach Yeshua, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Stop. You understand this now? Are you seeing the differences here? Not walking according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit? You don't need to walk according to the flesh if you're walking according to the Spirit. You don't need to be subject to the laws of, of Torah on the outside when you're following the laws of Torah on the inside as moved by the Ruach HaKodesh on the inside. You following? Keep going. For the, for the law of the spirit of life in Mashiach Yeshua has made me free from the law of sin and death. The, the law of the spirit of life that was given by the infilling of the Ruach HaKodesh is free from the law of sin and death that's related to the Torah. You can't be, sin, you can't be saved by being perfect and following the Torah externally. You have to be changed on the inside and following God's instruction on the inside. Go ahead. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That's how our righteousness exceeds those of the scribes and Pharisees. Go ahead. For those who live according to the flesh set, set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you who are you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of the Messiah, he is not his. And if Messiah is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of the righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Yeshua from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Messiah from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are, as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Let's read Matthew 5, verses 19 through 20, which says this. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So how do you exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees? By not walking after the flesh that is subject to the commands of the cloud, but walking in the spirit that is subject to the commands of the Ruach HaKodesh, the fire of God. This is why you are not under the law any longer. The law 
any longer, the law of the cloud any longer. That doesn't mean you're supposed to throw the law out because if you do, you are as on the same level as a pig because a pig doesn't know the difference between what is dirty and what is wrong. You have to know the difference. Submitting yourselves unto the righteousness of God. Romans 10, 1 through 4 says this. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have, ze have, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Messiah is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The, the Jews of that day chose to continue on the path of addressing sin on the external and rejecting the mindset and the guidance that God gave us on how we need to be changed on the inside. And they created their own form of righteousness, which is in the form of works, which no man or woman will find salvation in. It is only through faith and following the righteousness that God has provided through his son Yeshua that we find life everlasting and a way to live our lives in fullness and abundance. If you have to cleanse your flesh with the Torah, you're not being sensitive to listening to the Spirit. So in closing, I'll leave you with this question to contemplate in this season. To be or not to be under the law, that is the question. It is our duty to praise the master of all, to ascribe greatness to the author of creation. For he's made us unlike the nations of the land, and has not placed us like the families of the earth. He's not made our portion like theirs, and our lot like their multitudes. And we bend the knee and bow and acknowledge our thanks before the king over kings, the holy one, blessed be he. He stretches out heaven and establishes earth's foundation. And the seat of his glory is in the heavens above, and the presence of his power is in the most exalted heights. He is our God, there is none other. True is our king, there is nothing beside him, as it is written in his Torah. And you shall know this day and take to your heart that the Lord, he is God, in the heavens above and on the earth below, there is none other. Amen.